This episode of Talk Your Book is proudly brought to you by Honan, providing a complete range of insurance, risk, and financial solutions. Bundy's called me up, told me to take a look, but stay stubborn as bulls and talk their own book. Get the money, get the money, get, get the money. Well, Charlie Jamison, mate, thanks very much for coming back on the show. I thought if you could start a little bit with uh, Jamison Coot Bonds and um, how you guys look to invest, it'd be a good starting point. Well, Jamison Coot Bonds uh, is set up to invest only in government bonds. Now, obviously, in the fixed income product space, that's quite unusual. There's uh, all kinds of fixed income from government bonds all the way through to probably high yield or leveraged loans. Clearly very different credit qualities across those different instruments, different liquidity expectations, different return expectations. So we chose the most boring part and the lowest returning part, uh, but also the most liquid part. And so then it starts to become a a good defensive asset that works in conjunction with other riskier assets to balance portfolios, lower portfolio volatility, be defensive, although it hasn't been very defensive this year, and we'll talk about that no doubt across the show, but um, in general works you know, as a negative correlator to other assets. And, and in moments like COVID, you know, people uh, took a lot of uh, capital away from us as a manager, which is absolutely correct. Uh, bonds had done very well in that moment. Obviously, other assets had been deeply discounted. Uh, they wanted to go and buy their favourite growth assets. You need to be able to get to that ammunition storage. Government bonds is that ammunition storage. So you draw down hard on that. Part of the portfolio asset allocated across, and that worked spectacularly for everybody through 2021, and obviously 2022 has been a whole different set of challenges, uh, and it really emanated out of the bond market. So we'll no doubt talk about that in a, in a moment. And we've had an interesting, uh, well, bond markets all around the world are pretty interesting at the minute. But Australia, more closely, if you look at Philip Lowe, who's been in the headlines recently, uh, repeatedly said, famously now throughout. COVID, we won't even look at raising interest rates till 2024, which I think a lot of people in financial markets thought that's an interesting thing that he feels like he can predict that. Uh, But people that aren't in financial markets would have just said, well, he decides when interest rates go up, therefore they're not going up till 2024, let's leverage up to our eyeballs and and they've done so and and now starting to feel the pinch. What are your thoughts on, on what transpired there? And I guess we all make mistakes but is that a big enough mistake to just say, this was such a big blue, I feel sorry for the damage I've done, I need to tap the mat here? The, the mistake was making such a, a forward prediction, uh, you know, with so much certainty at that time. And even back in that moment, they had this uh, yield curve control program, which was to anchor rates at, at only uh, 0.1 of a percent, extraordinarily low. And they said that they would, uh, would you know, would follow that through to, to, you know, to kind of the fruition of the program as well. Both that and the forward guidance, we call it, uh, were obviously not followed and they flipped around and done something entirely, raising rates in May 2022. So, look, this has not been an easy period to predict because obviously things have been so volatile. COVID really picked up the jigsaw and just threw it in the air and the pieces landed all over the floor. But making those, um, you know, single predictive and long dated and repeatedly kind of too, it wasn't and like repeatedly you said it has, definitely wrong footed folks, and probably those least able to afford that wrong footing. You know, new home buyers levering up a capital asset that'll be their biggest capital asset, and it's obviously under uh, sufferance at the moment in terms of its value. Um, there's more rate hikes to come, almost certainly, and the bond market is predicting a, a lot more. Uh, but also, in, and the reason that they're doing that is to kill inflation. But in killing inflation, they're probably going to kill the economy as well. So, you know, we've got more to deal with at the moment. Unemployment's still really low and things are bubbling along okay as much as inflation's high and cost of living is high. Thankfully, everybody uh, who wants one has really pretty much got a job. Uh, But that might change a bit as we look forward. And and so the bond market's already suggesting, um, you know, having had big uh, changes in terms of what it's had to believe from the central bank, and we'll talk about the way bonds have repriced that in a minute, uh, that we will get probably a bit of stimulus after such a period of hitting the brakes so hard in 2022. And we're seeing that around the world, that we're starting to price in as much as we've got much more interest rate hikes to come in terms of their realisation over the balance of this year, maybe some interest rate cuts into next year. Uh, and already where equity markets are trying to find a level to, to rally off. You know, we're well off the lows that we saw, I think, in June already. Uh, but the reality of it is is that it's a really difficult period for central bankers because inflation really changes the game as to how they can respond and provide that pivot in the policy which allows things to then heal. It's much harder to put the safety net under the market 
uh, when inflation is still high because they're a long way away from their inflation mandate. So this is a bit of a different cycle versus, say, 2020 or 2018 when the market's got the wobbles. Um, in that 2018 period, bonds again led the sell-off. Then corporate credit markets, so again bonds, but you know, in companies rather than governments, um, had a bit of a seizure moment. And that becomes a real big problem because that is the financial lubricant that plums the whole system. And equity markets had about a 20% drawdown in December 2018. Now, you were probably at a Christmas party and don't even remember, uh, but that actually changed... I, I unfortunately do remember. It was yeah, <laughs> that, that changed policy at that time and the US Federal Reserve stopped hiking rates and went to neutral on the 4th of January 2019. And then they started cutting rates by July and that was um, obviously accelerated the next bull market. That pivot is harder to find this time because inflation is still going to be too high. So it's a bit more of a stand on your own two feet moment in a world that's got very used to constant policy accommodation and you know, kind of paper cracking over everything that might become a problem. There's definitely probably going to be a few problems. And so uh, you know, asset allocation and security selection are going to be really important. And so you mentioned yield curve control in Australia's experiment with that and, uh, and trying to keep yields at uh, 0.1 of a percent. When they stopped that, there, there was no press conference, no one, I mean, they, they released papers saying that they were stepping away from it. You know, coming from an industry in AFL where if Jordan Ngoi's film Drinking Beers in Bali, there's a, <laughs> you know, weeks and weeks of, of analysis of, of it, you would have barely known it had happened if you weren't really interested in markets, yet those bonds are effectively being bought by everyone's yeah. money in Australia. Should there have been more transparency on what had happened, how much they'd bought, why they'd stopped it? I think there will be. There's going to be this inquiry into the RBA and its processes, and they're hoping for bipartisan support in that process. But just from a process point of view, the RBA is obviously run by a board of governors, and its policy is set as a board decision. And so when that yield curve control moment ended, which was in October 21, uh, there was no press conference, there was no board meeting, and Lowe told us after the fact that it was at his discretion. Now, that's a process fail that in the corporate world would see you ejected out of the building. And so I think that absolutely there needs to be more uh, discussion around that uh, because it was a really big moment. Obviously, uh, international investors, uh, a bit like, you know, famously broke the Bank of England, George Soros did in the 1990s. They really broke the RBA and its yield curve control. And that matters for Australians because we pay the bill. That's you know? right. And right. Australia, you know, last August it was borrowing 10-year money at 1%. Uh, fast forward to this year, it was more than 4%. And that's, a, you know, collectively a trillion dollar borrowing program. That's a lot of interest that Australians have to find. Now, obviously, the monies that have already been borrowed don't need to be financed at those levels because that interest rate is set. But going forward, we are borrowing at much higher uh, yields. And so not dissimilar to folks uh, at home whose mortgage payments are going up, the government's interest bill is going up as well. And so we all have to find more money to service those debts. And so... Yeah, it's a, it's a big issue and it's obviously taken a lot of international investors away from Australia. They've just put their hands up and said, we don't trust your central bank. They've said one thing and done entirely the other. Uh, and that comes at a time when we also have this process of financial tourism. So you know, in a world where we had a lot of negative yielding assets, and that's just a crazy concept in and of itself, that you would actually pay someone to look after your money. Well, that's absolutely been the case uh, up until last week for, you know, really eight or nine years in, in Europe and for a long time in Japan, those investors would look all across the world to find some income. And they'd found Australia and they thought, you beauty, your AAA rated country, liquid market, hinged to the Asian century and relatively high yields. This is the Rolls Royce of bond markets. I'm happy to invest there. But these types of episodes clearly, uh, you know, pull them out of, of here. And it coincides with a time where there's uh, you know, different opportunities now available at home. And so rather than facing deeply negative yields in their own domestic markets, yields are higher and they can probably invest closer to home. Uh, you know, they're not as high as in Australia, but it, it's much simpler to invest in your domestic market than to invest a long way from home. So Australian bonds, as a result of that, have had a very big sell-off. Uh, they've lost a lot of sponsorship and they're going to trade a bit cheaper in their relativity to other global bond markets. They tend to move as a complex uh, because international investors will otherwise arbitrage away really, you know, if you get rates that are really high in one high quality market, people will flood in there. Just like if there were really cheap banks in America, people would end up selling Australian banks and buying American banks. 
So there is a, a relativity to these assets and, and unfortunately as a result of these actions, Australia goes a little bit unsponsored for a while, which is not a good thing. And you mentioned that uh, the bond market's telling us more interest rate rises are coming. What's the bond market telling us in terms of how many more rate rises are to come? And then I, I guess flowing on from that, what's your forecast for Aussie house prices as it relates to those increasing interest rate rises? Um, Everyone well, wants to know about Aussie house prices. Yeah, well, and, and rightly so, because you know it's such an important asset for so many folks, you, you and me included, no doubt. Um, look, the markets have priced up to 4.5% within a year for the RBA cash rate. Now, and we're 1.35 now, aren't we? So look, clearly that's absurd. Yeah. Uh, it is not impossible, but it is very improbable because the amount of economic pain that would be delivered on, on the population at that point is just not politically stomachable. So, um, but markets always overshoot in these moments and having come from what had been a very compressed level because of these policies and these promises, slingshot all the way back the other way. They don't stop at fair value. Their momentum carries them on. And I guess the markets have been searching around for how much rate hiking do we need to do to dampen demand to take inflation back towards lower levels. Uh, and that's a very difficult question to answer, particularly in a world intertwined with geopolitics and war and energy shocks and these types of things. Um, at the moment, I think, you know, most people expect the RBA will raise up to but somewhere between 25 and 3% and then probably have a pause. So we're at one thirty-five today. Almost certainly, uh, you know, 50 to be delivered in August, probably 50 or half a percent to be delivered in September. So we're already getting up to that level. But if we look at the forward data, there is already a, a material slowdown in global economies. And so uh, there's a, a lot of data that's been released in the last few weeks that would suggest that we're slowing very quickly. It's probably likely that America is in a very mild recession at the moment. Uh, it had a negative GDP print in the first quarter of this year. It's very likely with some now casting to suggest that it's going to have a, a slight negative again uh, in the second quarter. When you look at that, do you class it as real GDP? Like, are you taking yeah. inflation away? Yeah. Yeah. yeah but most people so. just talk about nominal GDP, don't they? Yeah. Yeah, no, but it, look, it's, it's almost certainly occurring. Uh, we're going to have a, a huge recession in Europe because of what's going on in Russia, Ukraine, and there's uh, you know, big energy problems around Europe and through the UK. So 2023 is going to have its challenges, and it's going to be hard, as I said, for central bankers to, uh, to really kind of uh, deliver any kind of accommodation to reprop things up a little bit. So uh, with the RBA still expecting to, to carry on, we've got to expect that house prices continue to come down. Uh, I think that you know, you're seeing them accelerate fairly quickly in the leading markets of Melbourne and Sydney, but other jurisdictions will join along. Um, and then the big concern is that all of these fixed rate mortgages which were set over 2020 and 2021 start to roll off from the second half of next year. And that would ordinarily in and of itself stop the RBA from hiking because that will be a material tightening on the economy. Uh, you know, there were a lot of mortgages that were set with fixed rates at you know, below 2% and they're going to reset into 4 something or potentially even 5 something. That's a hell of a funding increase. So uh, I think that you know, house prices down 15 20%, which is really just an unwind of what we saw in that acceleration phase. If we land back at 2019 levels, I think that that's probably pretty sensible and rates will be higher at that point. Uh, obviously, you know, we'll probably have a bit of a, a shortage on our hands in some of the major markets. It's going to be hard to, for developers to build because build costs are already hugely high, supply is difficult, and if there's uncertainty about that forward delivery environment, then they'll pull back and, and slow down and we'll get that undersupply again and that'll probably help clean the market up a little bit at that point. As soon as rate cuts come along, dive on in and buy that investment property and away we go again. So uh, the thing I'm sort of struggling to get my head around is we lost 600,000 workers during COVID. They went back to... The overseas workers that were in Australia went back to, to their home country and they haven't come back at this stage. I mean, we've got huge staff shortages everywhere. The RBA right now hell-bent on getting on top of inflation and, and wage inflation, a, a really sticky part of inflation. It feels to me it's going to be different to reduce those jobs in an environment where you're already short 600,000 workers and the only way you actually reduce those jobs is not by causing businesses to hire less, but actually putting more businesses to the wall than you would in a normal environment when you don't have those staff shortages. Is that a fair read? Um, and if so, it's just going to be a brutal, brutal um, cycle that, that's to come. I think that's, that's absolutely right, sadly. Um, 
you know, as much as we'd love to encourage people to come back, people have been worried about coming back from getting locked down That's again. Right. Those types of things. So Australia's definitely lost some of its appeal because of the severity of the way that we, we dealt with COVID. We've all lived that. Uh, and so, yeah, getting that... And they did generate a lot of that, you know, low-paid uh, kind of a job, um, you know, su supply in terms of employment supply. So, yeah, we do have a very tight labour market at this stage. We have a very different inflation set up to other parts of the world. It's important to recognise that as well. In the US, everybody got fired. And then in rehiring them, there was a big war for talent. Out came the checkbooks and there were some really chunky pay increases that were offered and wages really took off. With the JobKeeper program here, everybody, everybody uh, you know, kind of was um, told to, to just take it easy at home for a while. You didn't lose your job. You received something and then you'd come back probably into a similar role and similar firm. Um, so there hasn't been that acceleration, but we're certainly starting to see it now with you know, the Fair Work Commission uh, going you know, for a 5-1 or whatever it was recently. Um, there's isolated instances where there's a lot more request, and that's fair enough. You know, the cost of living has definitely gone up considerably, I think. You know, when you look at the headline inflation rates that get published and you look at your grocery bill, they just don't match up, do they? And there's still some of these hugely deflationary elements within those baskets, like I bought a new TV the other day, it costs nothing. You know, I remember buying one five years ago. They were expensive. Relatively, the prices come down a lot. You just can't so, afford to pay for the power to keep no, that's it on. Exactly right. I've got to pedal harder on the push bike. Um, but uh, yeah, so but but so those things line up. But there's no question with high utilities, high fuel prices, uh, high food prices for us as a result of you know weather interruptions and the like. Um, and you know, and then we've managed to get ourselves, God knows how, into a national gas shortage as a massive energy exporter. You kind of look at some of those things and just think, how is this possible? You know, who, who's in charge of this stuff? But lo and behold, here we are. We're going to face, obviously, we face a very cold winter on the East Coast and huge power demand. Uh, and so these things are not going away easily and, and quickly. So we've got to expect that, um, that, you know, inflation is going to be a little bit higher for, for a period. And certainly, you know, the antidote to that is to cause pain, sadly, and to take away that demand and to... Uh, you know, trying to, to you know, bring that demand back to meet the appropriate lev levels of supply and find that equilibrium in the market. I mean, you're very much in this central bank world, but when you look at all the goings on around the world, I mean, we'll get to Europe in a minute and what's happening there, which is crazy. But, but do, you, do, you, do you think we get close to a point where we say the world we've created where a group of unelected elders, for want of a better term, decide when they're going to crash the market and cost, you know people we know their jobs and their livelihoods and their ability to, to buy a house and when they're going to inflate asset prices so that rich bankers don't lose their shirt is this just something people are always going to be whinging about or do we get are we getting close to a point where not just people that are in financial markets but everyday people are like something's just not quite right here a absolutely i mean the, the terminology is privatize the gains socialize the losses yes yeah. something that we've all borne the cost for as a society through from the GFC on, where so much of this stuff that was structurally incorrect has been papered over with these crazy low interest rates and these quantitative easing programs, printing money, buying securities, manipulating market pricing to encourage people to take additional risk. That's actually really quite unnatural. And then there's this kind of concept in, in physics called entropy, where essentially things just violently retract back to the way they kind of always were going to be. And so with the volatility in a market, you can suppress it to a point, mm. but then jack-in-the-box just kind of pops out and goes explosive, as we were kind of experiencing this year after what was a really calm, slow grind, nice and volatile, wonderful time to be a bull market investor, getting paid every day, prices are just increasing and getting income to this violent reset led by the bond market. Bond markets at the start of this year had about a 10% plus sell-off, and at that time... Australian equities, via their very heavy commodities uh, exposures in, in indexes, were only off about 3%. So that's quite unusual for bonds to be you know, outstepping equity returns by well, such a 40 years, moment. isn't it? But pre that 40-year period, they did used to go up and down together, didn't they? did. They? The they, last they, 40 they, years... The correlation isn't static by any means. Generally, you know, if there's liquidity coming in, in or out of the system, they will become more positively correlated. But under material stress, people... We have what's called a flight-to-quality moment. And that quality being, well, I think the government will be the last thing that will be here, sometimes sadly, uh, but it's got much more surety than a corporation which can clearly die. Governments don't die. Sometimes we probably wish they would. Uh, but death and taxes are the two certainties and, uh, you know, the government can always tax their citizens to repay those bonds. Now, 
if you go to an Argentina or you know somewhere of that uh, magnitude, then clearly that can be hugely problematic. But in credible Western governments, then there is always the assumption that that can occur. So under real material duress like COVID, you get this um, you know appreciation in bond prices whilst everything else is depreciating very violently. And that's where that asset allocation be can, can become really powerful for investors to say, you beauty, I've got something liquid that I can then monetize it again to go and buy a ton of stuff deeply discounted. And then as it comes back the other way, you've made a lot of money. Uh, and if people are looking for a Fed pivot, which you know equity investors are all uh, talking about because yep. that's become such an important part of stock picking, is that generally what you're looking out for when it's more likely to happen, when you see bond prices dropping at the same price as equity yeah, is getting crunched? That seems to... The, the, the pivot will actually come in the corporate credit market. So... Again, this gets a little complex, but um, corporates just have to be able to roll forward their debt obligations. So it's yeah. not about borrowing new money. Now, remembering that bond markets globally are about three times as big as global equity markets. So not a lot of people know much about them. They are very boring. Most people at dinner parties want to sit next to their real estate agent rather than their local bond manager because we're a pretty dull bunch. But the reality of it is, is that it's a very important part of the financial process where these corporates... Think about you know, a high growth company with not a lot of you know, free cash flow, but it's got a really good business idea. We've seen thousands of these over the last you know, 10 years, in, particularly in the tech space. Want to borrow money, probably in the high yield market, it's a bit risky, but that is not a perpetual loan. You know, after five years or three years or 10 years or whatever the term is, the money needs to be repaid or reborrowed. Now, generally it's rolled forward and it's rolled forward at the prevailing market rate. Think about if you had to reborrow your mortgage money every three years, well, you know, six months ago, you could have got cheap money and now money's become more expensive. You've got to pay more. There is a point at which, though, the markets refuse to relend some of these folks. And that's where the blockage occurs. And that's tremendously important because if you look at something like, well, particularly in the international markets like Russell 3000, which is, the, you know, the mid caps, smaller caps, uh, about 20% of that market as an equity market is completely contingent on refinancing itself in debt capital markets. So we call them zombie corporations. They do not have the free cash flow to, to exist as an entity on their own two feet. They are contingent on debt financing. And so if that financing is not readily available, as they start to go down, clearly it takes the whole complex with it. And it just becomes a death by association moment. And that is where the pivot becomes interesting because probably where it's triggered and that's when the really high quality and good assets get dragged with the bad ones and therein is the big opportunity. So again, you know, like anything, you've got to have your preset plays. You need to know how you're going to deal with that moment and what you might want to invest in at that time, uh, when and how that is triggered or you know, what kind of geopolitical event uh, could become what we call systemic. When we have a US dollar that is this strong, it generally tends to, to cause issues in emerging yeah. markets. And so, you know, we're seeing that in Sri Lanka and places like that at the moment. Uh, that is not systemic enough for global markets to worry about. But if it became Brazil or something bigger, well, then that could be, you know, one of those kind of things that it just comes at, out of nowhere. It's one of those unknown unknowns, as Donald Rumsfeld might have said. Uh, and it can become hugely problematic. And it's fascinating the way markets will just flip around on their narratives. All of a sudden, they only care about the Turkish lira and the collapse of well, hang on, you know, I thought we were just talking about inflation and now we're talking about growth and we're on to the next thing. They really do tend to change gears on these things and it, uh, the press obviously falls in behind them and it becomes in its kind of own cycle in a, in a sense. So, uh, again, with all that we've got to go through and looking for that pivot, it will come, I think, when we have a bit of a crescendo in those corporate credit spreads and they, those spreads have been widening. What we mean by that is it's getting more and more expensive for corporate uh, borrowers to borrow versus government bond rates. And so not only are government bond yields moving higher a lot, uh, but the rates that corporates are being asked to pay in addition to the government bond is also moving higher. Now, that's no good if you're a corporate borrower, but if you're a corporate investor or a government bond investor who hasn't invested yet, that's good news because you're getting paid a lot more income now. And so bonds are really restoring their highly defensive capability in that they've got a very high, what we call running yield. So if you think about that, like a dividend, the dividends have gone up hugely. They are legally binding contracts, those, those coupons, we call them. Um, and obviously, you know, in equities, it's best endeavours. You know, dividends yeah. are there until they're not. And, uh, and obviously, if we're going to run into a, a difficult recession, as is possible, certainly, with what we're doing with, uh, you know, economic policy at the moment, then, you know, there can be a period where that's not as sustainable. And 
we touched on Europe before, but they've raised rates recently 50 basis points up to zero, A which in and of itself is, is hard to get your head around. But whilst doing that, they also announced sort of a form of QE. They called it something else. What do they call it? Uh, it, it it's an anti-fragmentation tool to try and, and secure you know, funding for countries like Italy. Now, Italy is shockingly indebted. It has negative demographics. Yeah. Negative demographics just doesn't work with an indebted system. So if you think about it really simply, if there's 10 houses in a street and 10 families own them, then everything is in equilibrium. If one of the families die, how much is the 10th house worth? Well, in theory, not much. The reality of it is somebody builds a tennis court. But you can see that if everybody has debt on those houses, if one becomes available and empty, well, that's a huge problem. And so we're seeing this in places like Japan. Obviously, a lot of countries changing in their demographics. Thankfully, in Australia, ours are improving uh, a lot. But China rolls from being a huge growth engine to becoming a negative demographic machine in about 2030. So some of these changes are you know, occurring you know, quite quickly, and that's important for us as we sit down here, you know, hugely leveraged to that growth vehicle because you don't need to build as much stuff if there isn't going to be as many people. Uh, and so we need to think those, through all of those kind of issues. But um, yeah, Europe is a, a real hotbed of, of activity always. It's boiling hot there. There's always issues in the European summer. Uh, but it just, it, it, as a construct, it's such an incredible construct that it, how even it's got this far. If you've ever, I worked in Europe for a long, long time, and if you've sat in a room with uh, you know, the French, the Italians, and the Germans, and the North, and the South, everyone's got such you know, aggressive opinions about things, trying to find a cohesive you know, central policy through all that. Obviously, some folks work harder than others, and who should pay for what? Um, it seems that it, it could be a, you know, a setup that's destined to fail longer term. But for now, they're trying to paper over things where, in particular, Italy uh, is a country that uh, otherwise its debt, uh, the, the, the price of its debt would be astronomical at this point. It's about to have a big industrial recession. It's very predicated to Russian gas, which is not going to be available. And I think probably uh, less available as winter approaches. Putin is a really bad guy, but he's a very capable bad guy. So that makes him <laughs> even the worse worst kind. again. Yeah, absolutely. He's kind of... Um, and, he, you know, he's been around since, you know, Clinton days. He's come and... and come, everyone's come and gone and Putin's still there. So for all the inexperience or the seemingly senile, you know, leaders in the US these days, um, you know, Putin is there and he's a, he's a bit of a grand chess master. So I think that... Uh, discounting him is a dangerous prospect because he seems to have everybody where he wants them at the moment. As much as the war is, is shocking and, and horribly nasty for those that are involved, it is causing huge disruptions on global markets uh, as it you know, pertains to you know, both food and energy. Uh, and it's, um, it's not over yet. So you know, I think there's um, a big grand game to be played there and seemingly he has the best negotiating position to gain territory or whatever he wants if he freezes Europe to death in the winter and he actually owns the keys to that. So uh, watch this space. And what about the US? What's the US bond market telling us about rate rises there? And I think they're forecasting rate cuts early next year, or the bond market is anyway. Yeah, so the, again, the, the US has been uh, you know, estimated to have this you know, tremendous hiking cycle. If we think back to 2018, we were talking about it before where we got that Fed pivot, the Fed funds rate, which is like the RBA cash rate, got to 2.5%. Now, it got there slowly, but it caused the credit markets to seize up, and that was November 2018. And that was in a peaceful, hug thy neighbour, buy cheap energy, lowest cost of production everything world, with actual pretty good visibility into the future. Clearly, we don't live in that world anymore. There's a lot more uncertainty and a lot more instability. We're going to be at 2.5% Fed funds as of tomorrow. And the rate of change, it's, it's been not just the size, but it's the rate of change, which has yeah, been so sharp, hasn't and, it? And the impact on the economy, obviously, is, is predicated on both price and time. So if we all have to make one mortgage payment at 6%, it hurts like hell and we don't go out for dinner that month, but probably find a way, hopefully. But if you've got to make 60 mortgage payments at 6%, well, you drown when your nose is just this far underwater. So it's that time component. If we hike aggressively and then cut... Well, then there is the chance that we can have what we call a soft landing or a mild recession. If we need to keep rates higher for longer, then that allows that delinquency element to start to build up. And you get the, you know, Mr. Jamison, this is really a very serious situation, letters from the bank becoming increasingly red and increasingly legal, saying, you have not paid your obligations as we agreed you would. 
uh, or however that works. And, and then obviously at some point there's a foreclosure moment and that can be really nasty. So nobody wants to see that occur. Uh, US bond market is suggesting that the Federal Reserve have still got a lot more to do to break this inflation psychology. Now inflation we can kind of think about in, in a few substacks. It's up to about 9% and a lot of that has been with the energy push from the war. But broadly, if you were thinking about it, you know, in the eights or nines, there's about a 2% normalised inflation rate, about 3% thereabouts for overstimulus coming out of COVID. So these extraordinary programs that Biden um, pu um, passed combined fiscal and, and monetary all together, and then about 3% from the global shock of war, inflation, food, that type of thing. Already we're seeing a, a, a real uh, retreat in things like goods inflation. So if you follow equities, uh, thing, uh, companies like Walmart and Target are talking about huge inventory builds, um, deep discounting to clear that inventory. If you talk to your mates that have got businesses that deal with this, if they're getting a 30 or 40% fill, well then they might order twice as much to get what they need to service their business. Problem is one day twice as much turns up and they don't have the ability to A, pay for it or B, store it. So they've got to discount it to clear it. And so you can see this thing in, uh, in economics, it's called the bullwhip effect in the inventory cycle, where you go from deficit to surplus almost immediately. Now some of these things that have been poster childs for you know, undersupply, the big one was uh, semiconductors out of, out of South Korea. And you know, we can't make cars because we can't get the semiconductors. All of a sudden there is a glut of semiconductors on global markets. And so the good thing about humans is we're really good at solving these problems, you know, and where there's a will, there's a way, and certainly where there's money to be made, people will do it. The big problem we've got in that uh, con complex at the moment is energy is a harder and longer problem to solve. There's been a lot of underinvestment because of, you know, clearly the shift to ESG bias, cleaner energies and the like. Uh, and all the folks that were in you know, oil sands and fracking and these types of energy production, they got bankrupted in the last cycle. So getting capital to go and do that again is not easy and it's not fast. But we will solve those problems in time, I guess. Um, and, but we've got to expect that we can have pretty violent volatilities in that energy complex until that time. But in the inflation uh, construct of that, it is a rate of change function. So if oil prices go from 40 bucks a barrel to 80 bucks a barrel, 100% inflationary. 80 to 120, only 50%. And if it stays at 120, inflation becomes zero. Now, obviously what we've seen with the war, we started at about $90 a barrel, we got up to about 130, and we're back pretty close to 90 or 94, I think, uh, as of today's filming. So generally, and, and with a lot of other commodities, we're actually lower in price than where we were at that time. Things like wheat and corn and a lot of the base metals and this kind of stuff. So there is an expectation that these things can come off and that will be deflationary, which is a good thing. Even though 90 buck oil is still high. It's, it's still it's high. In, anyone in that, eight months' time, Anyone that fills up their car on Saturday morning, it's still a bit of a shock. Yeah. I mean, you watch it click up very quickly. Uh, but in terms of the way that it impacts inflation and therefore policy, it starts to lose its, eff, you know, its efficacy at that, that point. And, so, and if it becomes disinflationary or deflationary, well, then clearly they can let the reins out a little bit and, and give us a bit of policy accommodation back, which will help folks out and be so good for investors. The yield curve in the US uh, has inverted. Is the whole curve inverted? The 2s and 30s inverted as well? So the 2s uh, and 10s have inverted? Yes, it would be. 2s uh, and 10s is at negative 23 basis points. Now, this is a perfect predictor of recessions. Within in 18 months, is that right? Not, right. not so tomorrow. Then, no, not tomorrow. Well, I think we're already in it, to be yeah. honest. Um, but it's had one false negative in 1967, and don't ask me why, but okay. I just know that. Woodstock era. Yeah, and essentially, it, 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 if you think about um, a, a term structure of interest rates, get, not to get too technical, it's good if central bankers are dealing with inflation now because it kills future inflation expectation. And so that's why those longer dated maturity bonds come, their yields become lower than really short maturity bonds. And in that process, they can actually do quite well. And so since we've seen the peak in those bond yields, you know, bond returns have been up four or five percent, which is quite a lot for, for a bond market. Uh, but as I said, they'd had huge drawdowns prior to that. But that expectation is that you know, around the next corner, the economy slows down uh, and it's likely that central bankers in time, with the benefit of time, bond yields will be low. So it starts to, to invert. As we said, it, it's a perfect predictor. Um, somehow it inverted in 2019 and foresaw the COVID slowdown. Now, the economy was going pretty slow then anyway. Uh, and so whether that would have occurred in and of itself without COVID, we'll, we'll never know. But certainly it is predicting that we will have a and uh, probably a reasonable recession um, 
you know, we're going to have to continue to hike interest rates into the third quarter, and it's very likely in the US, as we said, that we've had negative GDP in Q1 and Q2. So it's uh, a little bit longer and deeper than, than folks might have remembered in the certainly the last 10 years since the GFC. And so that gives you an insight into what's going to happen in the next 18 months once you see the yield curve invert. But is that the bear market steepener which says a recession you're in or is in imminent? Is that right? Well, so the statement would be when the short-dated bonds are starting to rally very aggressively in expectation the Fed's of Fed rates. rate cuts. Yep. So uh, bond yields can trade a long way away from the, you know, the, the central bank rate in expectation of these moves. So this huge sell-off that we've had has been in expectation of high inflation prints, which have now been realised. Bonds are rallying a lot at the moment in expectation of much lower growth outcomes in, in time uh, and in that process much lower inflation rates. Now, once the central bankers actually get their communication around to say we're done with rate hikes, that's when the equity markets will take off. Yeah. Um, now, that probably is triggered by a blockage in that credit system that we talked about because that's not something that you know we can naturally live through. It, it becomes too problematic and starts to cluster into too many areas of the financial system. It's something that does need to be dealt with. And generally in that moment, what they need to do is provide certainty to lower the volatilities to then encourage people to go and get invested. And so by going to that neutral pivot is that big trigger moment that, uh, you know, that will, will uh, be obvious and, and a, you know, a really clear marker in terms of road signs that we're good to go from here. A lot of folks are going to try and work out where that is before it happens to get in front of that. Um, so you know, I don't think it's an easy thing to do, but obviously when it does finally occur, from there on uh, is probably the safest part of the investment cycle. And then after you get policy accommodation, which again, spinnaker up and you're away and it's pretty good sailing from there on. And that is where you can own assets, you get the income of and you're probably expecting capital appreciation in a lot of things as well. And that's a very virtuous period in the investment cycle. Luke Groman's been speaking a l- quite a lot about tax receipts and with how financialised the US has become that capital gains and property prices play such a big role in, in essentially funding the US economy through tax receipts. That's not really being spoken about a lot. Are you seeing, I think New York's tax receipts last month were down 30% year on year. Obviously they're highly financialised compared to other states. Um, are you seeing much discussion pop up around that and just how big the deficit's going to be if equity markets and other asset markets continue to be crushed like yeah, this? Yeah, it, it's, it's always a concern. Uh, it's the reason that we can't raise rates indefinitely. It's called, yeah. We have what we call escape velocity, so the system implodes on itself because it can't afford its own debt burdens. Unless no you get... Sorry to interrupt. Unless, unless you inflate it away... Correct. ...until government debt in the US to GDP is close to 70 or 80%. Then yeah. you can normalise rates but at in, some in, level, is in, that right? In doing that, obviously, everybody has a real backwards uh, return in terms of their income versus in their In real income. terms, so you've got to run it your really Your cost of living in real terms is falling dramatically. That's right. Middle classes are getting pushed backwards into the lower echelons. And but longer term, that's sort of the only real option, isn't it? When debt to GDP is this high, you can default. Yeah, or, or you can you've got to get productivity money on up massively and you can grow your way through it. Now, you know, I think we've reached that moment where we've yanked the lever of the globalisation of the system in terms of finding cheap everything. And demographics now, are shit too in the Western world. So you and, and, you know, that trust thy neighbour and have a single line of sight to a supplier, those, those days are over. I mean, we yeah. tried that and it didn't work in 2022 when said supplier, probably China, said we're closed for a while. Sorry, guys, good luck. Um, so there's a lot more... And that is inflationary in and of itself. Now, I don't think that everything gets made in North Melbourne tomorrow because of that or wherever, you know, it might get made. But it does mean that there is a big shift in that supply process as to people have to find, you know, credible sources of supply and spread it out. And in doing so, it raises the cost of of gaining that supply in in some way. But no, you're dead right. I mean, I saw uh, on Twitter this morning a random thing that New York subway ridership isn't expected to hit 2019 levels until 2036. So you get all these systems that just... They're set up to, you know, run on a revenue assumption with a pretty high fixed cost base and all of a sudden the revenues are gone. And that is hugely problematic for municipal governments and certainly it's why we're seeing, uh, you know, in in state government bonds in Australia, these spreads versus federal government bonds have been widening. How do, you know, the states gain a lot of their revenues? In stamp duties. Fines, obviously, as well. You stop driving so quick. Um, But, uh, you know, those are obviously under, you know, pretty material question at the moment. Will the volumes be there to generate the stamp duty? I mean, obviously it's great if it's at high prices, but they really need voluminous transactions. 
And bear markets don't encourage volume. It's, uh, you know, the only people that are having to transact probably don't want to be. Those that are buying probably do, but those that are selling are not enjoying the process so much. So that's where a lot of those things do come under question. And clearly, you know, when you live under this, um, you know, debt burden, it's problematic. Someone's got to pay the bill. You know, someone's got to pay the piper at some stage. Clearly, in very low rate environments, that's easier to do. Once uh, rates rise a bit, then it generally slows economies down. And in response to that, it becomes deflationary and we can lower rates again and the, uh, the circus carries on for a little longer. So is it oversimplified way of looking at it to say, with this much debt in the system, if stimulus doesn't come from central banks, really do have a deflationary bust? I don't think that's being melodramatic. Like that's Absolutely. Yeah, I mean or they eventually do inflate or do, do stimulate before inflation's dropped to 2%. You're it's not going to drop to 2%. It might be at 5%. You, yeah, either way you lose. You either lose because of the notional, the inflation is so high and your real uh, living level is declining at such a rapid rate you lose, or you have a deflationary bust, and oh. that, that must occur. But if you look at what those same said central banks that make the rules, what they actually need before they can normalise interest rates is they need to get that debt GDP level down. And that the most realistic way to doing that is by running this thing hot for an expense, like post the, post World War Two. It, it, it's really just been this incredible domino series of things that have triggered this inflationary you know, response, and so the, the pent up demand from lockdown, the overstimulus in terms of fiscal, and then combined with monetary, and then straight into a global war, energy problem, and a Chinese lockdown. Those things will normalise and clear themselves, which means rates will come down in time. But yeah, there's got to be an equilibrium. Clearly, we're not going back to the government borrowing money at 1% for 10 years. Uh, they paid more than 4%, you know, as I said a few months ago. But somewhere in the middle probably looks like a more reasonable long-run uh, you know, assumption. But deflation is the scariest thing for, Absolutely. For, cent for governments and central bankers, isn't it? If yeah. you had to weigh what would they, you they, give they you a central would, banker, on the deflation side of is the worst bit. enemy because that's... Absolutely. That's carnage. They would definitely err on the side of running it a little bit higher in terms of inflationary outcome than deflation because once you get stuck in it, aka it's Japan, reflexive. you cannot get out. And people start delaying consumption in expectation that it's cheaper tomorrow than it is today and the whole thing just cascades in on itself. So you're dead right. Very good, mate. Well, that was great. I don't feel like those people at the uh, dinner parties. I'd be a nightmare being <laughs> seated at your dinner party. You go, he's driving me mad with all these questions. I wish he'd shut up and talk about the footy or, or something else. But, um, mate, thanks very much for coming on. Normally it was, um, it's it was pretty boring, fun. but at the moment there's actually a lot going on, so it's kind of getting a bit more interesting. But ordinarily, very boring. Thanks, mate. But Cheers, mate. This episode of Talk Your Book was proudly brought to you by Honan, who go beyond a transactional insurance broker to deliver better outcomes for their clients. If you're enjoying Talk Your Book, make sure you subscribe to Chris Judd Invest.